Hello, my friends. I thought it might be good to give some insight into the time period when this book was written. Bushido, The Soul of Japan was first published in 1899. I looked up the beginning of some inventions from about that time, and this is what I found. The first true automobile is often credited to Carl Benz, in 1885 to 1886. The first mass-produced automobile in the United States was an Oldsmobile in 1901. The famous Model T Ford didn't come out until 1908. Thomas Edison patented his electric light bulb in 1879 but electric lighting didn't become widespread until the 1920s. Alexander Graham Bell applied for a patent for his telephone in 1876. Guglielmo Marconi first sent and received a radio signal in 1895, but early radio was radio telegraphy, that is, Morse code sent by radio. Voice was first sent by radio in 1915. The Zeppelin airship was invented in 1900 by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, and the Wright brothers' famous 12-second flight of a powered, heavier-than-air aircraft was in 1903. We can see that it was a very different world that Nitobe-san lived in, and it's interesting to read this book with that context in mind. And now, let's enjoy part two of Bushido, The Soul of Japan. To the pervading characteristics of the men of whom Monsieur de Mesliere writes, let us now address ourselves. I shall begin with rectitude or Justice, the most cogent precept in the code of the samurai. Nothing is more loathsome to him than underhanded dealings and crooked undertakings. The conception of rectitude may be erroneous, it may be narrow. A well-known bushi defines it as a power of resolution. Rectitude is the power of deciding upon a certain course of conduct in accordance with reason, without wavering. To die when it is right to die, to strike when to strike is right. Another speaks of it in the following terms. Rectitude is the bone that gives firmness and stature. As without bones the head cannot rest on top of the spine, nor hands move, nor feet stand, so without rectitude neither talent nor learning can make of a human frame a samurai. With it, the lack of accomplishments is as nothing. Mencius calls benevolence man's mind, and rectitude or righteousness his path. How lamentable, he exclaims, it is to neglect the path and not pursue it, to lose the mind and not know how to seek it again. When men's fowls and dogs are lost, they know how to seek for them again, but they lose their mind and do not know how to seek for it. Have we not here, as in a glass darkly, a parable propounded three hundred years later in another clime and by a greater teacher who called himself the way of righteousness, through whom the lost could be found? But I stray from my point. Righteousness, according to Mencius, is a straight and narrow path which a man ought to take to regain his lost paradise. Even in the latter days of feudalism, when the long continuance of peace brought leisure into the life of the warrior class, and with it dissipations of all kinds and gentle accomplishments, the epithet Gishi, a man of rectitude, was considered superior to any name that signified mastery of learning or art. The forty-seven faithfuls, of whom so much is made in our popular education, 
are known in common parlance as the 47 Gishi. In times when cunning artifice was liable to pass for military tact and downright falsehood for ruse de guerre, this manly virtue, frank and honest, was a jewel that shone the brightest and was most highly praised. Rectitude is a twin brother to valor, another martial virtue. But before proceeding to speak of valor, let me linger a little while on what I may term a derivation from rectitude, which at first, deviating slightly from its original, became more and more removed from it, until its meaning was perverted in the popular acceptance. I speak of giri, literally the right reason, but which came in time to mean a vague sense of duty, which public opinion expected an incumbent to fulfill. In its original and unalloyed sense, it meant duty, pure and simple. Hence we speak of the giddy we owe to parents, to superiors, to inferiors, to society at large, and so forth. In these instances, giddy is duty. For what else is duty than what right reason demands and commands us to do? Should not right reason be our categorical imperative? Giddy primarily meant no more than duty, and I dare say its etymology was derived from the fact that in our conduct, say to our parents, though love should be the only motive, lacking that there must be some other authority to enforce filial piety. And they formulated this authority in Giddy. Very rightly did they formulate this authority, Giddy, since if love does not rush to the deeds of virtue, Recourse must be had to man's intellect, and his reason must be quickened to convince him of the necessity of acting aright. The same is true of any other moral obligation. The instant duty becomes onerous, right reason steps in to prevent our shirking it. Giddy, thus understood, is a severe taskmaster, with a birch rod in his hand to make sluggards perform their part. It is a secondary power in ethics. As a motive, it is infinitely inferior to the Christian doctrine of love, which should be the law. I deem it a product of the conditions of an artificial society, of a society in which accident of birth and unmerited favor instituted class distinctions, in which the family was the social unit, in which seniority of age was of more account than superiority of talents, in which natural affections had often to succumb before arbitrary man-made customs. Because of this very artificiality, Giddy, in time, degenerated into a vague sense of propriety, called up to explain this and sanction that, as, for example, why a mother must, if need be, sacrifice all her other children in order to save the firstborn. Or why a daughter must sell her chastity, to get funds to pay for the father's dissipation and the like. Starting as right reason, Giddy has, in my opinion, often stooped to casuistry. It has even degenerated into cowardly fear of censure. I might say of Giddy what Scott wrote of patriotism, that, as it is the fairest, so it is often the most suspicious mask of other feelings. Carried beyond or below right reason, Giddy became a monstrous misnomer. It harbored under its wings every sort of sophistry and hypocrisy. It might easily have been turned into a nest of cowardice if Bushido had not a keen and correct sense of courage, the spirit of daring, and bearing, to the consideration of which we shall now return. Courage was scarcely deemed worthy to be counted among virtues, unless it was exercised in the cause of righteousness. In his Analects, Confucius defines courage by explaining, as is often his wont, what its negative is. Perceiving what is right, he says, and doing it not, argues lack of courage. 
put this epigram into a positive statement, and it runs, Courage is doing what is right. To run all kinds of hazards, to jeopardize oneself, to rush into the jaws of death, these are too often identified with valor. And in the profession of arms, such rashness of conduct, what Shakespeare calls valor misbegot, is unjustly applauded. But not so in the precepts of knighthood. Death for a cause unworthy of dying for was called a dog's death. To rush into the thick of battle and to be slain in it, says the Prince of Mito, is easy enough, and the merest churl is equal to the task. But, he continues, it is true courage to live when it is right to live and to die only when it is right to die. And yet the Prince had not even heard of the name of Plato, who defines courage as the knowledge of things that a man should fear and that he should not fear. A distinction which is made in the West between moral and physical courage has long been recognized among us. What samurai youth has not heard of great valor and the valor of a villain? Valor, fortitude, bravery, fearlessness, courage, being the qualities of soul which appeal most easily to juvenile minds and which can be trained by exercise and example, were, so to speak, the most popular virtues early emulated among the youth. Stories of military exploits were repeated almost before boys left their mother's breast. Does a little booby cry for any ache? The mother scolds him in this fashion. What a coward to cry for a trifling pain. What will you do when your arm is cut off in battle? What when you were called upon to commit harakiri? We all know the pathetic fortitude of a famished little boy prince of Sendai, who in the drama is made to say to his little page, Seest thou those tiny sparrows in the nest, how their yellow bills are opened wide? And now see, there comes their mother with worms to feed them. How eagerly and happily do the little ones eat. But for a samurai, when his stomach is empty, it is a disgrace to feel hunger. Anecdotes of fortitude and bravery abound in nursery tales, though stories of this kind are not by any means the only method of early imbuing the spirit with daring and fearlessness. Parents with sternness sometimes verging on cruelty set their children to tasks that called forth all the pluck that was in them. Bears hurl their cubs down the gorge they said. Samurai's sons were let down the steep valleys of hardship and spurred to Sisyphus-like tasks. Occasional deprivation of food or exposure to cold was considered a highly efficacious test for inuring them to endurance. Children of tender age were sent among utter strangers with some message to deliver, were made to rise before the sun and before breakfast attend to their reading exercises, walking to their teacher with bare feet in the cold of winter. They frequently, once or twice a month as on the festival of a god of learning, came together in small groups and passed the night without sleep in reading aloud by turns. Pilgrimages to all sorts of uncanny places, to execution grounds, to graveyards, to houses reputed to be haunted, were favorite pastimes of the young. In the days when decapitation was public, not only were small boys sent to witness the ghastly scene, but they were made to visit alone the place in the darkness of night and there to leave a mark of their visit on the trunkless head. Does this ultra-Spartan system of drilling the nerves strike the modern pedagogist with horror and doubt? Doubt whether the tendency would not be brutalizing, nipping in the bud the tender emotions of the heart? Let us see what other concepts Bushido had of valor. The spiritual aspect of valor is evidenced by composure, calm presence of mind. Tranquility is courage in repose. It is a statical manifestation of valor as daring deeds are a dynamical. 
a truly brave man is ever serene. He is never taken by surprise. Nothing ruffles the equanimity of his spirit. In the heat of battle, he remains cool. In the midst of catastrophes, he keeps level his mind. Earthquakes do not shake him. He laughs at storms. We admire him as truly great who, in the menacing presence of danger or death, retains his self-possession. Who, for instance, can compose a poem under impending peril or hum a strain in the face of death. Such indulgence betraying no tremor in the writing or in the voice is taken as an infallible index of a large nature, of what we call a capacious mind, yo-yu, which, far from being pressed or crowded, has always room for something more. It passes current among us as a piece of authentic history that is Ota Dokan, the great builder of the castle of Tokyo, was pierced through with a spear. His assassin, knowing the poetical predilection of his victim, accompanied his thrust with this couplet. Ah, how in moments like these our heart doth grudge the light of life. Whereupon the expiring hero, not one whit daunted by the mortal wound in his side, added the lines, had not in hours of peace it learned to lightly look on life. There is even a sportive element in a courageous nature. Things which are serious to ordinary people may be but play to the valiant. Hence in old warfare it was not at all rare for the parties to a conflict to exchange repartee or to begin a rhetorical contest. Combat was not solely a matter of brute force, it was, as well, an intellectual engagement. Of such character was the battle fought on the bank of the Koroma River, late in the 11th century. The eastern army routed, its leader Sadato took to flight. When the pursuing general pressed him hard and called aloud, It is a disgrace for a warrior to show his back to the enemy, Sadato reined his horse. Upon this the conquering chief shouted in an impromptu verse, Torn into shreds is the warp of the cloth. That's Koromo. Scarcely had the words escaped his lips when the defeated warrior, undismayed, completed the couplet, Since age has worn its threads by use. yoshi whose bow had all the while been bent, suddenly unstrung it and turned away, leaving his prospective victim to do as he pleased. When asked the reason of his strange behavior, he replied that he could not bear to put to shame one who had kept his presence of mind while hotly pursued by his enemy. The sorrow which overtook Antony and Octavius at the death of Brutus has been the general experience of brave men. Kenshin who fought for fourteen years with Shingen, when he heard of the latter's death, wept aloud at the loss of the best of enemies. It was this same Kenshin who had set a noble example for all time in his treatment of Shingen, whose provinces lay in a mountainous region quite away from the sea, and who had consequently depended upon the Hojo provinces of the Tokaido for salt. The Hojo prince wishing to weaken him, although not openly at war with him, had cut off from Shingen all traffic in this important article. Kenshin, hearing of his enemy's dilemma, and able to obtain his salt from the coast of his own dominions, wrote Shingen that, in his opinion, the Hojo lord had committed a very mean act, and although he, Kenshin, was at war with him, Shingen, he had ordered his subjects to furnish him with plenty of salt, adding, I do not fight with salt, but with the sword, affording more than a parallel to the words of Camus. We Romans do not fight with gold, but with iron. Nietzsche spoke for the samurai heart when he wrote, You are to be proud of your enemy. Then the success of your enemy is your success also. Indeed, Valor and honor alike required that we should own as enemies in war only such as prove worthy of being friends in peace. 
when valor attains this height, it becomes akin to benevolence, the feeling of distress, love, magnanimity, affection for others, sympathy and pity, which were ever recognized to be supreme virtues, the highest of all the attributes of the human soul. Benevolence was deemed a princely virtue in a twofold sense, princely among the manifold attributes of a noble spirit, princely as particularly befitting a princely profession. We needed no Shakespeare to feel, though perhaps like the rest of the world, we needed him to express it, that mercy became a monarch better than his crown, that it was above his sceptered sway. How often both Confucius and Mencius repeat the highest requirement of a ruler of men to consist in benevolence. Confucius would say, Let but a prince cultivate virtue. People will flock to him. With people will come to him lands. Lands will bring forth for him wealth. Wealth will give him the benefit of right uses. Virtue is the root and wealth and outcome. Again, never has there been a case of a sovereign loving benevolence and the people not loving righteousness. Mencius follows close at his heels and says, instances are on record where individuals attained a supreme power in a single state without benevolence. But never have I heard of a whole empire falling into the hands of one who lacked this virtue. Also, it is impossible that anyone should become ruler of the people to whom they have not yielded the subjection of their hearts. Both define this indispensable requirement in a ruler by saying, Benevolence. Benevolence is man. Under the regime of feudalism, which could easily be perverted into militarism, it was to benevolence that we owed our deliverance from despotism of the worst kind. An utter surrender of life and limb on the part of the governed would have left nothing for the governing but self-will. And this has for its natural consequence the growth of that absolutism so often called oriental despotism, as though there were no despots of occidental history. Let it be far from me to uphold despotism of any sort, but it is a mistake to identify feudalism with it. When Frederick the Great wrote that kings are the first servants of the state, jurists thought rightly that a new era was reached in the development of freedom. Strangely coinciding in time, in the backwoods of northwestern Japan, Yozan, of Yonezawa made exactly the same declaration, showing that feudalism was not all tyranny and oppression. A feudal prince, although unmindful of owing reciprocal obligations to his vassals, felt a higher sense of responsibility to his ancestors and to heaven. He was a father to his subjects, whom heaven entrusted to his care. In a sense not usually assigned to the term, Bushido accepted and corroborated paternal government, paternal also as opposed to the less interested avuncular government, Uncle Sam's to wit. The difference between a despotic and a paternal government lies in this, that in the one the people obey reluctantly, while in the other they do so with that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of heart which kept alive even in servitude itself, the spirit of exalted freedom. The old saying is not entirely false, which called the King of England the King of Devils, because of his subjects' often insurrections against and depositions of their princes, and which made the French monarch the King of Asses because of their infinite taxes and impositions, but which gave the title of the King of Men to the sovereign of Spain, because of his subjects' willing obedience. But enough.
Virtue and absolute power may strike the Anglo-Saxon mind as terms which it is impossible to harmonize. Popio Donostiev has clearly set before us the contrast in the foundations of English and other European communities. Namely that these were organized on the basis of common interest, while that was distinguished by a strongly developed independent personality. What this Russian statesman says of the personal dependence of individuals on some social alliance and in the end of ends of the state among the continental nations of Europe and particularly among Slavonic peoples is doubly true of the Japanese. Hence, not only is a free exercise of monarchical power not felt as heavily by us as in Europe, but it is generally moderated by parental consideration for the feelings of the people. Absolutism, says Bismarck, primarily demands in the ruler impartiality, honesty, devotion to duty, energy, and inward humility. If I may be allowed to make one more quotation on the subject, I will cite from the speech of the German emperor at Koblenz, in which he spoke of Kingship by the grace of God with its heavy duties, its tremendous responsibility to the Creator alone, from which no man, no minister, no parliament can release the monarch. We knew benevolence was a tender virtue and motherlike. If upright rectitude and stern justice were particularly masculine, mercy had the gentleness and the persuasiveness of a feminine nature. We were warned against indulging in indiscriminate charity without seasoning it with justice and rectitude. Masumune expressed it well in his oft-quoted aphorism, Rectitude carried to excess hardens into stiffness. Benevolence, indulged beyond measure, sinks into weakness. Fortunately, Mercy was not so rare as it was beautiful, for it is universally true that the bravest are the tenderest, the loving are the daring. Bushi no Nasake, the tenderness of a warrior, had a sound which appealed at once to whatever was noble in us. Not that the mercy of a samurai was generically different from the mercy of any other being, but because it implied mercy where mercy was not a blind impulse but where it recognized due regard to justice, and where mercy did not remain merely a certain state of mind, but where it was backed with power to save or kill. As economists speak of demand as being effectual or ineffectual, similarly we may call the mercy of Bushi effectual, since it implied the power of acting for the good or detriment of the recipient. Priding themselves as they did in their brute strength and privileges to turn it into account, the samurai gave full consent to what Mencius taught concerning the power of love. Benevolence, he says, brings under its sway whatever hinders its power, just as water subdues fire. They only doubt the power of water to quench flames who try to extinguish with a cupful a whole burning wagon load of faggots. He also says that the feeling of distress is the root of benevolence. Therefore, a benevolent man is ever mindful of those who are suffering and in distress. Thus did Mencius long anticipate Adam Smith, who founds his ethical philosophy on sympathy. It is indeed striking how closely the code of knightly honor of one country coincides with that of others. In other words, how the much-abused Oriental ideas of morals find their counterparts in the noblest maxims of European literature. If the well-known lines, Hae tibi erunt artis, pacisque imponere morum, pacere subjectus et debilare superbos, those lines come from Virgil and they mean, these shall be your arts, to set forth the law of peace, to spare the conquered, and to subdue the proud. If those lines were shown a Japanese gentleman, he might readily accuse the Mantuan bard of plagiarizing from the literature of his own country. 
Benevolence to the weak, the downtrodden, or the vanquished was ever extolled as particularly becoming to a samurai. Lovers of Japanese art must be familiar with the representation of a priest riding backwards on a cow. The rider was once a warrior who in his day made his name a byword of terror. In that terrible battle of Sumano-ura, 1184 AD, which was one of the most decisive in our history, he overtook an enemy and in single combat had him in the clutch of his gigantic arms. Now the etiquette of war required that on such occasions no blood should be spilt unless the weaker party proved to be a man of rank or ability equal to that of the stronger. The grim combatant would have the name of the man under him, but he refusing to make it known. His helmet was ruthlessly torn off when the sight of a juvenile face, fair and beardless, made the astonished knight relax his hold. Helping the youth to his feet in paternal tones, he bade the stripling go, Off, young prince, to thy mother's side. The sword of Kumagaye shall never be tarnished by a drop of thy blood. Haste and flee o'er yon pass before thy enemies come in sight. The young warrior refused to go and begged Kumagaye for the honor of both to dispatch him on the spot. Above the hoary head of the veteran gleams the cold blade which many a time before has sundered the cords of life, but his stout heart quails. There flashes athwart his mental eye the vision of his own boy, who this selfsame day marched to the sound of bugle to try his maiden arms. The strong hand of the warrior quivers. Again he begs his victim to flee for his life. Finding all his entreaties vain and hearing the approaching steps of his comrades, he exclaims, If thou art overtaken, thou mayest fall at a more ignoble hand than mine. O oh, thou infinite, receive his soul. In an instant the sword flashes in the air, and when it falls it is red with adolescent blood. When the war is ended we find our soldier returning in triumph, but little cares he now for honor or fame. He renounces his warlike career, shaves his head, dons a priestly garb, devotes the rest of his days to holy pilgrimage, never turning his back to the west, where lies the paradise whence salvation comes, and whither the sun hastes daily for his rest. Critics may point out flaws in the story, which is casuistically vulnerable. Let it be. All the same, it shows that tenderness, pity, and love were traits which adorned the most sanguinary exploits of the samurai. It was an old maxim among them that it becometh not the fowler to slay the bird which takes refuge in his bosom. This, in a large measure, explains why the Red Cross movement considered particularly Christian so readily found a firm footing among us. For decades before we heard of the Geneva Convention, Bakin, our greatest novelist, had familiarized us with the medical treatment of a fallen foe. In the Principality of Satsuma, noted for its martial spirit and education, the custom prevailed for young men to practice music. Not the blast of trumpets, or the beat of drums, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death, stirring us to imitate the actions of a tiger, but sad and tender melodies on the biwa, soothing our fiery spirits, drawing our thoughts away from scent of blood and scenes of carnage. Polybius tells us of the constitution of Arcadia, which required all youths under thirty to practice music in order that this gentle art might alleviate the rigors of that inclement region. It is to its influence that he attributes the absence of cruelty in that part of the Arcadian mountains. Nor was Satsuma the only place in Japan where gentleness was inculcated among the warrior class. A prince of Shirakawa jots down his random thoughts and among them is the following. Though they come stealing to your bedside in the silent watches of the night, drive not away, but rather cherish these. The fragrance of flowers, the sound of distant bells, the insect humming of a frosty night. And again, 
Though they may wound your feelings, these three you have only to forgive. The breeze that scatters your flowers, the cloud that hides your moon, and the man who tries to pick quarrels with you. It was ostensibly to express, but actually to cultivate these gentler emotions, that the writing of verses was encouraged. Our poetry has therefore a strong undercurrent of pathos and tenderness. A well-known anecdote of a rustic samurai illustrates a case in point. When he was told to learn versification and the warbler's notes was given him for the subject of his first attempt, his fiery spirit rebelled and he flung at the feet of his master this uncouth production which ran, The brave warrior keeps apart the ear that might listen to the warbler's song. His master, undaunted by the crude sentiment, continued to encourage the youth, until one day the music of his soul was awakened to respond to the sweet notes of the Uguisu. And he wrote, Stands the warrior, mailed and strong, to hear the Uguisu's song, warbled sweep the trees among. We admire and enjoy the heroic incident in Corner's short life, when, as he lay wounded on the battlefield, he scribbled his famous farewell to life. Incidents of a similar kind were not at all unusual in our warfare. Our pithy, epigrammatic poems were particularly well suited to the improvisation of a single sentiment. Everybody of any education was either a poet or a poetaster. Not infrequently, a marching soldier might be seen to halt, take his writing utensils from his belt, and compose an ode. On such papers were found afterward in the helmets or the breastplates when these were removed from their lifeless wearers.